Great. So our last uh, presenter, our last speaker for this block is Heil Randers. So he is the um, TESOL professor and director of research at Anaheim University in the U.S. He's also a professor of applied linguistics at KMUTT, KMUT, I think it's pronounced, in <coughs> Thailand. Um, and he's also the founder of the Global Institute for Teacher Leadership and editor of the Innovation in Language Learning and Teaching. Um, and also, if you've taken the time to read his uh, bio on the website, you'll know that he also owns a goat, which might be... <laughs> raise some interesting questions later. So uh, hi, if you want to go ahead and turn on your camera and mic, I'll hand it over to you. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. So nice to see you. And thanks, Joshua, for the introduction. And thank you for mentioning my, my goat. Yes, indeed, I do have a goat, but I don't own it. The goat owns me. Um, I don't know if anybody here has any experience with goats, but they are very precocious animals. They have a mind of their own, and it certainly never listens to me. Uh, but in any case, we're not here to talk about that today. We're not here to talk about goats. We're here to talk about self-regulated learning, which is uh, a topic that um, some colleagues and I have been working with together with uh, OUP for the last, well, almost a year now, developing a position paper. And uh, most of that work was done by me through living in uh, New Zealand. But I'm actually speaking to you today from a very different climate. I'm in Brisbane at the moment, and it's like 35 degrees outside, so I'm no snow, uh, so it's very confusing. I live in New Zealand, but I'm te teaching online and currently in Australia, uh, but my goat is in New Zealand, in case you're wondering. So <laughs> um, what I'm going to do today is essentially give you a sort of a, a, a preview of the position paper, which is going to come out very soon. And really the purpose of that is to give you, well, first and foremost, an overview of what self-regulated learning is and secondly most importantly i want to get into the sort of the practicalities of what we can do to help our learners to become more self-regulated so the way to do that rather than starting off with a whole bunch of theory and i will include some theory later and certainly also some references that you can follow up on later but rather than starting there i'd like to start with uh, an example. And uh, Ling Peng uh, is one of the co-authors of the position paper, and she's going to tell you a little, very brief little story about a student who we shall call Surendra. Now, as you're listening to her sort of one minute uh, brief vignette, uh, I'd like you to kind of listen to figure out in what ways this student might be taking control of or regulating or making decisions about their own learning. So let's move on and let me hit the play button. Hi everyone from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the USA. I'm going to read a little vignette here for you. Surendra is in his final year at the Peace Comprehensive School and he's hoping to go to university to study engineering. He has been struggling with the English presentation skills class finding it really hard to come up with good topics and describe them clearly. He decides to watch TED Talks on YouTube while reading along with their transcripts, underlining keywords and taking notes on how the presenter structures their talk. He then records himself as he presents a summary of the topic. He watches the recording and compares it with the original presentation. At first, it takes him a long time to prepare, and his speech is not very clear. But he tells himself that such a difficult skill takes time to develop and to keep trying. After a few weeks, he starts to see improvement and rewards himself with a nice meal with friends. A nice meal with friends. Nice. That sounds really good. So I hope I you, I hope you're able to figure out that there's several ways in which this student, Surendra, is kind of thinking for himself about his learning process. And well, first of all, realizing that there are some areas of struggle. And I think this is a, a point that's easy to overlook and not just kind of figuring out, hey, I've got a, a problem in this area, but taking that one step further and trying to figure out why that is. And then think about what he could do to resolve that problem. In this case, looking for additional resources, online videos, TED Talks, et cetera. These can be 
as I'm sure you you know, very, very uh, good for, for language learners. But there's also an emotional sort of component. You know, things are tough. It's taking a lot of time. And he tells himself, well, that is to be expected. This is difficult. So I'll just keep at it. He's resilient. You know, he keeps trying. And he gives himself a, a reward at the end. All of these are sort of different types of self-regulation. So it's not just about making sort of micro decisions as you are engaging the particular language learning task. It's also about taking a step back and seeing the bigger picture or the, the wider process. Now, why are we focusing in this position paper specifically on self-regulated learning? Why do we feel it is such an important topic to discuss at this LTOC conference? Well, just taking you back in history a little bit, um, there was a couple of people, uh, Barry Zimmerman and Dil Schunk and several others at the time as well, who were very interested in educational psychology and were trying to kind of figure out what made some learners in their classes more successful than others. And what they observed was really interesting because they would have groups of students who in many ways were very similar, so similar in terms of prior learning experience, uh, maybe the similar culture, maybe even having the same sort of grade point average, GPA levels, etc., but still coming out of the course with very different, uh, very different results. And so they started kind of investigating this in a, in a systematic way. And well, a long story short, what they found was that out of all the things that had an impact on students' achievement, the most important one, the best predictor of academic success was whether or not the students they were investigating were engaging in self-regulated learning. So that's a really, really powerful, a really powerful insight because that means if it's so important, then maybe we as teachers and curriculum developers and materials designers also need to think about how we can help our learners, how we can support them in building their self-regulated learning skills. By the way, if you see this little icon on any of the slides, it means that there's a reference or a resource that I've included for you, and I will give you the link later to uh, an online handout that you can use to download those additional materials. I've, I've collected for you some podcasts and some uh, articles, and of course, also some academic references. So watch out for that little icon um, to pursue uh, later. So anyway, fast forwarding a few uh, a few years, uh, people like Barry Zimmerman and many colleagues continue to investigate this area. And what is quite clear by the year 2013, and even more so now, is that there are certain, certain skills that successful learners have built up during their academic journey. And Barry Zimmerman here uh, summarizes it actually very nicely. He says, students who set superior goals, good at goal setting, who proactively monitor their learning intentionally, who use strategies effectively and respond to personal feedback uh, adaptively, not only attain mastery, in other words, they don't only just get better, but they're also more motivated to sustain their efforts to learn. In other words, they don't give up. They, they stick with it even when things are difficult. And you can see here quite closely the relationship between self-regulated learning and motivation. They're really, in some ways, two sides of the same coin. Now, as I've been arguing and uh, spoken about in, in a few previous LTOC conferences, in some ways, in, in a lot of educational settings, not everywhere, not all the time, but in some ways, we're not always that good at uh, focusing on those types of self-regulated learning skills. A lot of what, what uh, happens in a lot of educational systems or traditional models, as Steve Thorne and John Reinhardt call it, uh, is basically an emphasis on following, following instructions, being obedient, adhere to established rules and practices, rather than kind of really actively focusing on innovation and creativity uh, and critical thinking. It's changing. It's certainly changing. And you can see this reflected in some of, of the materials that are becoming available, including some of the materials that OUP is putting out, like Insight, Insight um, Edition 2, 
is a, a very strong focus on critical thinking, but it's a slow process. Um, in the current sort of model, um, there is a still a very heavy emphasis on the, the classroom and the educational setting, the system, not so much on the individual learner. And as I've argued in, in previous, uh, in previous uh, conferences, previous talks, uh, and I'll very briefly refer back to it here, and again, this is on, on your handout that I'll give to you later, uh, it's very easy to forget that, well, formal learning is really only one of very, very many types of learning that learners can engage in. Uh, we wrote about this in our position paper last year on using technology to motivate learners. Uh, and on the handout later, you can uh, download some additional articles about this topic. So I won't go into too much detail here, but just to briefly remind you, as you already know, you know, learners can and do learn from game-based learning, flexible learning, self-learning, community-based learning, mentor-based learning, informal learning, peer learning, and probably a dozen other types of learning as well. And these all take place in what I like to refer to as learning spaces, because they don't have to be in physical places. They can be online, they can be within a community, they can be between learners. But the point I'm trying to make is that they are incredibly important. And in fact, um, people like Jay Scott estimate that somewhere in the vicinity of 70 to 80 percent of adult learning takes place outside of formal education in these sorts of different learning spaces. And what that means for us and in the context of our conversation today is that, well, firstly, as I think we've already known for a very long time, we need to focus on lifelong learning. We need to help our learners to develop self-regulated skills to be ready for the future when you or other teachers may not be there for them anymore. But as Oliver Bailey just said in the previous talk, uh, I've also written in the past uh, about the importance of life-wide learning. So this is not in the future. This is across any given moment in time, across a learner's life. And well, if we recognize that so much of adult learning does not take place in a classroom with a teacher who is constantly there to support you, but takes place in all these other learning spaces. Well, then we as teachers need to support learners to become ready for both lifelong, but also for life-wide learning. So that's why I want to focus um, in this presentation on self-regulated learning, because it's a key for us to support our learners beyond just our immediate uh, physical environment, beyond the classroom. Okay, where do we start? It all sounds nice, right? But <laughs> how do I do this? <laughs> where do we begin? Well, you're in luck. We have, as I said, a position paper coming out very soon, I think in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's called The Key to Self-Regulated Learning, um, and that will have uh, a lot more detail and examples and etc. Then I can give you in in a short presentation today. But keep an eye out for that. Um, that will become available. It's freely downloadable, and we'll have a lot of uh, ideas for you. But what I want to do today is focus on one part of that position paper. So in that paper, we have two kind of components. We are fo we focus <clears throat> on the sort of organizational level. So how do schools, uh, in universities, institutions, managers, etc. How, how can how can communities like that uh, kind of integrate self-regulated learning into their curriculum? And then at the, the pedagogical level, what can individual teachers do to make that happen? Now you can imagine that those two have to come together, right? If people down here are doing something that goes contrary to what people up here are doing, or vice versa, you know, we're not we're not collaborating. So a lot of the paper is about how can we actually work together. But here and now, I want to focus on this second part, the pedagogical aspect. And well, what I want to talk you through and give you some quick examples of, as I said, more will be in the position paper, but just to give you an idea of what it looks like, um, is, is take you through the self-regulation process. And um, well, as a culmination of 
several decades of, of research, both others' research and my own research, this is a framework that essentially covers all of the key components that make up self-regulated learning. So rather than as an individual teacher, me having to think about, you know, how do I help learners to you know, do this or do that or think about their own learning this way and when and where, well, this is essentially a relatively straightforward uh, framework that will guide you in doing that. So I'll talk you through it. There are six stages um, and it starts at the, uh, at the top right with motivation for self-regulated learning. We'll talk about that in a moment. And two key points to bear in mind is that this is a, a model that's what we call iterative. In other words, you go through it and then you start it again and again and again, because of course, self-regulated learning continues essentially throughout your entire life. And the second point about the framework is that it's, it's quite systematic. It enables you to jump in anywhere. You don't necessarily need to go through it you know, from here to there, but it will keep you, it will keep you uh, grounded. It will help you to plan and to know what you've covered and what you haven't covered. And therefore it will be, uh, it will allow you to help your students develop self-regulated learning skills in a systematic way. Now let's talk through these briefly. Um, it all has to start from actually making your learners uh, understand and be motivated to take responsibility for their own learning, right? And I've observed this myself in my early career where I was very interested in learner autonomy, I still am, and I, I would just go in and tell students, you know, this is so good for you, you know, you, you go and do what you want and study what you like and, you know, it's your call, your responsibility. And in many cases, I would be disappointed that students wouldn't take up that invitation, right? I didn't understand and it took me some some time um, and, and talking to colleagues and doing some research to figure out that actually learners first and foremost didn't have the skills to be able to just go and study what they wanted because they didn't know how and secondly they didn't they didn't understand what the rationale was what the benefit was what, why would I need to think about my learning isn't that what I hire you for as my teacher right literally I had students tell me this like you know I'm paying you to tell me <laughs> you know so helping learners to understand why it's actually meaningful to make choices about your own learning is a key step and again here's a short uh, vignette from uh, our co-author uh, Ling Pong, you can read along with it as well, giving some uh, examples of what this might look like uh, in our particular uh, imaginary school. At Peace Comprehensive School, teachers begin by asking learners to describe how they normally approach their learning and to list all of the different examples on a board or screen. Learners are asked, for example, how they prepare for a test, learn vocabulary, or do their homework. With the younger learners, teachers join in group play and ask children to describe what they are doing and why. Next, they ask learners to say why they think each of the mentioned ideas might be helpful and describe how successful learners use each of the examples. Next, they ask learners if they recognize that some of their choices share similarities and group themes. For example, some might relate to planning, others to maintaining concentration. They explain how successful learners use examples from all groups and how together they represent the different aspects and stages of learning a language. Some teachers ask learners who were previously in their class and who have now moved on to higher years to come and share some of their success stories. Finally, they show how in the coming course or term or semester, they will help everyone to learn the stages for themselves and how learners' improvement in this area will be evaluated. Thank you, Lane, even though you can't hear me at the moment, but thank you anyway. So you see, it's not that the teacher just jumps into the classroom and one day just, you know, out of the blue, 
tell students to make decisions for themselves. There is a conversation about this. There is there is a justification, a, you know, a rationale given to the learners. Maybe other learners are asked in from higher classes to come and explain how they manage their own learning or how they became successful. And the key point here is that it's it's planned. You know, how you plan it, of course, depends on your, your learners and their age and how, how much prior experience they might have with this. But the key point is it needs to be planned in such a way that the learners themselves understand why this is not just you know somewhat important but actually in some way some of the most important skills that they are going to learn from you and the course and here's a, a fun activity um that that seems to work quite well you know i in some of my classes get my students in the first week to write a short essay how i received an a in this course and of course they haven't even taken the course yet but it gets them into a mindset of you know thinking about how they would have to sort themselves out and behave themselves and what actions they would have to take throughout the semester or, or course to be able to be successful and it, it puts the keys into their hands you know it's saying oh you know what do you think and then of course we have a conversation about that and we share our ideas so after helping learners to understand the why, the next stage is to help learners to understand what it is they need, right? Helping them to identify their needs. And needs, broadly speaking, come into three different categories. We have language needs, you know, obviously. We also have learning needs. You know, there are certain study skills or, you know, thinking skills that perhaps we could improve that might help us. And then there are also the all important emotional needs. So very briefly, going over these and giving you a couple of examples. In most classrooms that I'm familiar with, most of the time, uh, it's the teacher that essentially tells directly or implicitly uh, through you know, test scores and, and, and so on, what it is that uh, I would need as a, as a learner. In other words, I, I always have this told to me. But of course, there are many ways in which we can invite learners into the process of figuring out what they need. And, and, and share their personal experiences about what they have found works well for them, what doesn't work so well, why they want to learn the language, and so on and so forth. And, well, I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are so many types of uh, techniques and, and uh, ways in which, as teachers, we can, we can bring this into the educational experience through peer feedback and self-assessment, can-do statements, assessment for learning and as learning, dynamic assessment, and a whole raft of other ones many of which, by the way, are in this position paper that came out a couple of years ago, published by Oxford University Press, and that you can also download uh, for free from their website. And again, the link to this is in the online handout. The point here is not so much which technique you might use, but that you ask yourself how you could help your learners to become able to identify where they are at any given moment and what else they might need. I remember having so many conversations when I was working in the self access center many years ago in New Zealand. I was, I was running the self access center. We would have students coming in, um, you know, spending tremendous amounts of time uh, learning about you know writing and, and academic reading, etc. When what they really wanted and needed was just to have everyday conversations with people. And I said, look, you're spending all this time, but you don't actually need it. So forget about that, you know, do something that you actually, that you yourself actually need. Um, there are many other um, interesting ways in which we can identify um, other aspects of needs as well. Take, for example, learning needs. Um, the words OUP here are actually made up of all the different study skills that, uh, that are out there, and there's probably many, many more, but as you know, you know, digital literacies, critical thinking skills, uh, you know, academic writing skills, discourse analysis, um, data analysis, uh, and so on, uh, evaluating sources, experimentation. These are all sort of 21st century skills or, you know, soft skills, whatever you want to call them, that some learners, you know, are more advanced in than others. But similar to the previous list, it's about getting your learners to think about their own, uh, their own, confidence with such skills and uh, without having to rely on 
you. And there's a couple of good resources, uh, including one that uh, Ling Peng and myself wrote on, on this topic. So, you know, there's a lot of good resources that will help you to, uh, to bring this to your learner's attention. Uh, and including in the, the white paper, a, a sort of a self-assessment uh, sheet for study skills that your learners can uh, complete by themselves. Again, it's not really about the specific resources here. It's more about what would work in your context. How could you get your learners to understand what it is that they need in terms of their various skills? And that also includes emotional needs. And I think it's still something that is under-recognized in, in language uh, education. It's, it's better, but it's still, I think, not given enough attention. We have learned so much in the last few years from research on what is called a field that is called the psychology of the language learner. We've learned so much about the impact that both positive and negative emotions have on learning, you know, anxiety, uh, but also, you know, boredom uh, and positive emotions, curiosity and excitement. And in, in some ways, uh, these types of emotional aspects of learning have a far greater impact than everything else that happens uh, around it. So it means that you know, for us to be successful, especially in the long term, you know, as we know, emotions and emotional responses you know, go up and down, and sometimes we feel very motivated and, and you know, eager to learn, and sometimes um, we are bored and anxious and you know, the ability to recognize in ourselves as learners our current emotional state and the ability to work with it in a positive manner in the long term is something that uh, will have a, a tremendous impact on, on your learners. And it can be as simple as starting a conversation with your learners about, well, how they approach their learning uh, from a, a sort of a more affective or emotional point of view. Questions like, what is, what is holding you back in learning? What is stopping you? Maybe it's a fear of speaking. Maybe it's a, a fear of making mistakes. Maybe it's something else. How do you deal with setbacks? You know, language learning is hard. What, what do you do when things don't go well for a while? You know, how do you manage that? How do you motivate yourself? How do you keep going? And these are really powerful questions to start a conversation with uh, your learners. There is, by the way, and I just, again, this will be on your handout, uh, a, a very good questionnaire that you can use that uh, uh, Kono and uh, Oxford developed. And the link, again, is on your, on your handout that you could use to sort of figure out your learners' uh, self-reported ability to manage their emotions in language learning. Which brings us neatly on to my second uh, pet, uh, my corgi. Um, this is actually a, a photo of his of his face, and then AI kindly turned it into an artwork. He's obviously flying off to the moon, so he's he set his his goals really high. His name is Jumper, by the way. Um, but yeah, the next step after motivating your learners to understand why self-regulated learning, recognizing what they need to learn, the next step is to set you know meaningful, smart goals. Um, and this is actually proven to be one of the key kind of uh, determin determinants in, in language learning success. Dil Shung, Barry Zimmerman, research has consistently shown across all educational domains that having meaningful goals helps learners to persist in their studies and leads to greater motivation. You can see how all of these things are really, you know, um, enmeshed uh, and, and tied together. And when we talk about goal setting, it doesn't have to be a, a dry academic exercise. My colleagues and friends, uh, Satoko Kato and Joe Minard from Kanda University in Japan, for example, in their book on language advising, use a, a, a dream goal pyramid. And they use this as a sort of a fun activity early on in, in the course to get learners to think about what they would really like to achieve, but then break it down into, well, if you want that, uh, you will need to first do this, and in order to do this, you will need to, you know, maybe develop certain habits. Or so you can see how the the conversation about uh, a dream goal is turned into uh, a practical set of uh, questions. And and here's another one from the same source. Um, you know, using vision boards. And I've seen some really amazing ones that can be done online, of course, using multimedia, or they can be done in class. But getting students to kind of put together an image of how they see themselves at a certain point in the future. 
especially as it relates to uh, learning this language. So if I, if I achieve a certain level of proficiency in English or whatever language I'm learning, this is what I will be like, you know, as a person. This is what I'll be able to do that I, I wasn't able to do before. And so you can see the, these are really kind of fun uh, activities. Uh, a slightly more systematic approach, which I'll just very briefly mention again, it's on your handout, is the, the WHOOP uh, approach, uh, which is essentially a way of breaking down uh, our goals into you know, identifying a wish, visualizing uh, an outcome, um, you know, recognizing certain obstacles, and then from that, developing an actual learning plan. Again, I'm sort of skimming over these fairly quickly because the focus is not primarily on this, but I'm you know, showing you how the different steps within the framework come together. But uh, if you're interested in any of these, have a look at the, uh, the handout for more uh, detail. Goals and plans. You might say, well, isn't that sort of the same thing? And I guess, yeah, in a way, but uh, a goal is sort of a longer term, you know, uh, direction that, you, that you're going in. You know, you're, you're setting your destination, if you will. Whereas the plan is deciding, well, you know, how am I navigating this street? How am I getting to the other side of the road without getting hit by a car? And so it's your, it's your shorter term sort of set of, of practical activities, your plans, uh, what you're working on in, say, the coming days or the coming uh, week. And knowing how to do that, again, is not something that a lot of learners are good at without guidance. A lot of learners are not systematic, right? They, they don't have a system for their daily learning, apart from maybe setting certain times at which they learn. But the actual approaching of a particular uh, learning task is something that a lot of learners do without giving it a lot of thought. But getting your learners into a mindset where they are kind of thinking for themselves, you know, like, what can I actually achieve today or this week? Not waiting for the teacher to say, you know, today, we're, this is what we're going to do. So now you have to open your textbook on page 25. And then, you know, by the end of today, we're going to finish this module. That's all fine and good. But beyond that, as an individual, I need to also know what it is that I'm trying to achieve this week, because some of that will have to do with the class and the teacher. And some of that will be specific to me and my interests and my needs. And it also means thinking about decisions like, well, what should I do first today? You know, a good strategy is always to do the hardest thing, the thing that you really dread the most first thing in the morning and get it out of the way. A lot of studies have shown that to be very successful for a lot of people. But also questions like, well, what resources do I need? You know, not just books and you know websites, but also, you know, whether it's native speakers, other learners, teachers, etc. Do I have those resources? Where where can I get them? And what if things go wrong? Where, where can I get support this week uh, or with this particular task if things don't pan out? So you see, planning your learning on a sort of a day-to-day -day basis is actually a skill that has a major impact on long-term success. And it's something that learners very much benefit from uh, developing. The next one is, is a really interesting one because it actually consists, as you may recall from the, the model, of three, three parts. So this is where we are actually doing a language learning task. All right? And this might be I don't know, having a conversation with a stranger on the street, or it might be engaging in some role play in the classroom. It could be formal, it could be informal, it doesn't matter. So each of these will be an activity, will be a, a task. And there are three components, again, to this. In order for me to be successful in learning by myself, well, it'd be good if I could think about what resources are most meaningful for me to carry out this activity. If I need to write an academic essay, uh, probably having access to an online corpus and an online dictionary would be a great uh, idea. Having access to a model essay that I can use to get inspiration and see how uh, proficient writer structure their academic essay would be a great uh, resource to have. But a lot of learners have, you know, become used to other people, teachers, mostly teachers, giving them the resources that they think that they need, rather than having to look for them themselves. And a lot of learners also don't have necessarily the skills to identify what are good resources, what are reliable sources. Previous presentation by Oliver Bailey, of course, talked about chat GPT. Well, 
learners need a whole set of digital skills, literacy skills, to be able to recognize, um, determine levels of trustworthiness and distinguish between fake news and you know, real news and you know, a lot of other related areas. So when you engage in a task, you need to not only find the right resources, but also you need to know how to make best use of those resources, which includes you know, using those materials and engaging in the task in a strategic way, not just blundering into a conversation with a stranger on the street if you are not proficient in English language speaking, but doing a little bit of planning beforehand and maybe practicing some communication strategies and maybe learning how to ask for clarification or knowing how to ask somebody to repeat what they said. You know, the kinds of things that we often practice in class, but encouraging learners to think about and decide on the strategies that would be helpful to them. So you can see, by the way, that self-regulated learning and strategies are two very closely related, but also quite different topics. In the final part of the task regulation, when I am actually engaged in a task, well, I need to know if I'm, if I'm actually learning anything. And again, most learners have become accustomed to teachers telling them, yeah, you're doing great, you know, or, you know, correcting them or giving them additional or alternative tasks. But actually, as a self-regulated learner, you need to be able yourself to know how, how you're doing. And so asking your learners, maybe before you do a task, some powerful questions like, well, how will you know when we do, a, do this task, when you're having this role play conversation, how will you know if, if, if it's going well? What tells you that you may need to do something different or try something else? Um, who can help me? You know, is there somebody who can who I can ask or who can support me? Um, how can I find out what I need to work on more? So when I finish with this task, will I actually take a couple of minutes to think about, you know, what I could improve? And do I have any ideas for what else I could try maybe next time? You know, questions like what made it difficult for me and what am I going to do next? Again, these are just some you know, sample prompts, but the underlying point here is that rather than just giving your learners the activity and then giving them the feedback and then telling them what to do next, it's inviting this process of getting learners to start thinking about these kinds of decisions themselves and giving them feedback <laughs> not just on how they perform the specific task that they're engaged in, you know, did they do a good job on the role play or not, but also giving them feedback on their ability to plan for the task, to monitor their progress. In other words, you know, giving them feedback on their ability to monitor, to manage their own learning. The final, final point of the six is, of course, once you've you know, done uh, your studies and for a few weeks, a few, maybe a few months or an entire course, well, it's, it's time to take a step back, right? And in, in formal coursework, that is often done by an end of term exam or a test or something like that. And that basically tries to measure your progress over a longer period of time. And that can be helpful. But from a learner's point of view, from a lifelong and live wide learning point of view, I also need to be able to remind myself occasionally to just put everything down and say, hey, I've been doing this now for three months. I said my goal was to be able to do this and become like that and, you know, achieve that. How far have I come? And, you know, how, how are things going? Am I on the right track? You know, you can see this, this beautiful teddy bear here uh, is just about to walk off a cliff. You might be doing everything really well, but you might not be doing it well in the right direction. You know what I mean? And Learners are very good at just letting other people decide for them which direction they should go in and, you know, rely on the feedback and, and the test scores and uh, et cetera, and other people, external uh, information to tell them how they're doing. But of course, we also need to be able to assess ourselves. And, you know, that involves asking, you know, did my plans work out? You know, did I achieve my goals? Um, did I have the right resources? Was I able to motivate myself? Um, was I able to monitor my own progress, etc. And again, this is a, a dialogue that you can start with uh, in class. Of course, there's lots of very, very good 
resources out there. I mean, you know, portfolios and I, I like CISO for younger learners, for example, uh, but also uh, available documents um, like the English language, uh, sorry, European language portfolio and linguafolio and a whole bunch of other ones, um, all of which are on the handout. Uh, that, that you can use as a teacher to give learners the, the necessary instruments, the tools to reflect on their learning, to record what they do to, and to then monitor it and then uh, reflect on it uh, over, over time. So yeah, there is a lot that, uh, that, we, that we can do. Um, as as Ling Prung here says, you know, we can use learning diaries, portfolios, where learners can record their activities. Um, and of course, teachers can prompt um, learners to read their entries, but also share uh, their entries with other learners. So uh, this, is, this is quite exciting, you know, when, when learners can talk to each other about their progress and, and, and have a sense of achievement uh, and pride in uh, what, they've, uh, what they've learned. So coming to the final part, of the, the presentation before we open it up to a few questions. Just as a reminder, six steps, um, they are systematic and they're iterative. How exactly you do each of these, plenty of ideas in the position paper and throughout the presentation and on the handout, but the, the how is perhaps less important than, than the fact that you actually consider how you can help your learners to build these necessary skills. And if you do it in a systematic way, whether you use this model or something else, but as long as it's sort of structured and you know what you are working towards, you know, as long as you uh, are self-regulated yourself as a teacher, then you will have a clear goal and you will have clear plans and you'll know whether or not you're on the right uh, track. Now, just a final couple of words, and this is really just uh, mentioning what uh, Nathan Thomas uh, talked about uh, earlier today in, in his presentation and what will also be in the uh, in the, the position paper is that of course well you know introducing self-regulated learning is is uh, is potentially very exciting but for it to become not just a temporary sort of change in one classroom but for it to be actually successful in the long term and to turn into an innovation or an informed change um, in the underlying philosophy of language teaching and learning it has to of course uh, be be integrated across the wider curriculum. So we can't just look at our own classroom. We also have to take our cues from and share experiences with uh, the rest of the organization, which is why in the model, uh, the, the middle part you know, is, um, is, is open. You can see the dotted lines. There's information flowing back and forth between management and teachers and leaders and, um, you know, there is institutions, etc. So what we do at the at the chalk face in our teaching, it really has to be disseminated across the organization so that we can all change our practices and become essentially um, you know an organization um, that places more emphasis and value on not just learners' language achievement, but also on learners' uh, achievement in being able, becoming able to regulate their own learning for lifelong and life-wide purposes. And some, again, some quite, you know, pressing questions that maybe you and your colleagues can ask is, well, uh, can, can our learners maybe receive some credit for this self-regulated learning? Maybe we can, we can recognize and reward learners for their ability to take more control of their own learning. So not just giving them points for, you know, not making too many grammatical mistakes, but also recognizing when learners grow as, as independent learners uh, that are able to regulate themselves. Um, and that raises all sorts of questions around, for example, assessment. You know, do we still place the same amount of emphasis on centralized summative tests, or do we maybe want to investigate assessment for learning or a dynamic assessment or some other form of recognizing uh, the type of skills that learners uh, develop. And, you know, you can see how, how that is likely to uh, require a, a conversation between you as an individual teacher and your colleagues and probably your head of department and probably your head of department and their dean or their boss 
because decisions that are made at the, the classroom level will probably in some cases uh, result in a necessary readjustment at other levels of the organization. A really important part about this kind of coming together as, as a community is to share your findings. You know, you'll, you know, you'll, as you do this in a systematic way, you'll observe all sorts of interesting things like what are our students self-regulated learning needs? And it might be quite different between undergraduate or postgraduate or young learners and older learners or what have you. And, you know, where in our curriculum are we actually actively supporting them to develop these skills? Is it just me in my, in my one little class or are other colleagues also kind of working together and can we support each other? Um, you know, what works really well in our context and are there certain obstacles that we may need to talk about? So it's a, it really is a team, a team effort um, that requires probably also, you know, a certain degree of, of support from your managers and maybe some professional development for, for ourselves as, as teachers. So yeah, um, what it all comes down to at the end is essentially is it's up to us. You know, um, if, you, if you want to recognize that in a changing society where the emphasis has to be more on helping learners to develop independent self-regulated learning skills for their futures, but also for their life wide learning, that, that involves a change. And that's a change that has to start uh, somewhere. And well, I hope that it may start with you and that from today's um, conversation and um, from the position paper, you will get some, some ideas, some ways of, of starting that. And hopefully the framework will give you some systematic steps to, to go about that. Um, as I said, there's an, an online handout uh, with all the references and uh, some papers and uh, a podcast and things like that, uh, which you can download, just use the QR code or the link innovationandteaching.org forward slash OUP. Uh, and finally, just would love to hear from you. You know, if you have any, we have a few minutes for questions, 10 minutes, but uh, if, if later on uh, you'd like to get in touch and share your experiences or uh, ask for, for help, uh, you know, this is an area that I'm really, really excited and passionate about. So feel free to contact me in one of these ways. So I'll stop talking here and uh, I'll hand over to Joshua to read out some of the popular questions. So yeah. I'll just pop on screen for a minute and um, I'll get you back to full screen. But just wanted to say to all the teachers, if you do have questions for Hayo, pop them into the QA chats because we've got about 10 minutes and he can take some of those. So do pop your questions in the chat and I will start reading off a couple questions for you. Hayo. So the first one is, how can we encourage peer motivation in class with students of different intelligences? Mm, good question, yeah. Very good question. Well, um, the, the, the peer learning, uh, not just peer feedback, but peer learning uh, and near peer mentoring, I don't know if that's a term that is familiar to, to the person asking the question, but look that up, near peer, so near as in you know close, peer, P-E-E-R, mentoring, um, is, is one of the techniques that has been shown to actually work really well with, in particular, learners of, of not vastly different, but, you know, somewhat different levels of whether it's proficiency, language proficiency, intelligences, uh, different interests, etc. cetera. And uh, it turns out that um, actually if, if it's done in a systematic way, that it can actually really, really motivate both the person that is being supported perhaps more, but also the person that is doing the supporting and without going into the, the theory of the background, but uh, this actually ties in very closely with uh, self-determination theory, which the person asking the question may know about. Uh, of course, one of the key components of which is uh, relatedness. And so one of the key things that motivates us in life in general, but in lear learning specifically is whether or not an environment in which we are learning uh, supports us in uh, or encourages us to be supported and encourages us to support others. That leads to a sense of, of relatedness, which itself leads to a sense of, of motivation. If we feel that we can help others, if, if we feel that others care about us and they, they support and help us, we just feel better. And we actually, as it's, as it's been demonstrated, we learn more and we're more motivated to continue to learn. So yeah, look up near peer uh, mentoring. Uh, it's great literature on that. 
All right. Um, got a couple more here. I'll, get, I'll give you an easy one. Um, <laughs> someone's asking, uh -oh. what is Seesaw? I don't know if that's in your handout oh, yes. or not. Yeah, I, I very briefly skipped over that. So there's a lot of digital portfolio type apps. Seesaw, S-E-E-S-A-W, is, is a digital portfolio, electronic portfolio app uh, designed specifically for younger learners. My, my child, uh, my daughter, Eileen, I used it uh, when she moved from um, in, into primary school in the early years. And it's basically a way for young learners to take photos of what they've been learning and kind of keeping track of what they've done. And the really cool thing is that, like with all portfolios, it really inspires a sense of ownership, right? It's, it's, it's the, in this case, my daughter would say, Dude, this is my learning, you know, and she would hold up the portfolio. And that was really, really cool when, when I uh, observed that. And yeah, that works with both younger and, and older learners. The, the actual app that you use uh, doesn't, in my opinion, matter so much. There's, there's a lot of good ones out there. It's just one that I had a screenshot of, but uh, yeah. All right, um, we've got another one on, uh, let me read out here. It says, could students regulate a specific point in the learning process as such as grammar or reading? Yeah, yeah, good question. So, you know, you remember that, you know, it's the six components and one of them at some point you, you get into the actual tasks that you engage in as a learner, right? And well, that task could be about learning grammar, it could be about, you know, vocabulary. But, you know, rather than just, let's say I want to improve my academic vocabulary, okay? And, you know, I could just pick up a random book off the shelf in the self access Center and, you know, just jot down some occasional words and maybe look them up in a, in a dictionary. And, you know, maybe I'll learn something from that. But a more strategic, a more self-regulated approach to that would say, well, okay, I will improve academic vocabulary. What resources do I have? Oh, I've got some really great... Uh, essays that the teacher shared with us as, you know, good models, good examples of, of good writing. Okay, um, maybe I can, you know, maybe I can identify from those texts what are some of the keywords that people use that, that they seem to, you know, use a lot because they seem to be really, really important. And maybe I can jot those down and maybe I can just look up in the first place the meaning of, of those vocabulary items rather than anything and everything I come across. And maybe I can those ones into a memory flashcard learning uh, app of some sort and just you know practice with us it doesn't so matter so much in in the context of this example uh what the learner does but it matters that they are actually starting to think about how to approach a learning task rather than either just waiting for the teacher to tell them or to just do something randomly like jumping on the internet and just browsing for the next 45 minutes without knowing where you're going. So helping learners to become more systematic and to plan more carefully for how they go about their actual learning activities will have a tremendous impact, uh, especially when measured over the years of, of how much they can, how much they can do and how much they actually end up uh, enjoying it. Great. Thanks, Hayo, for answering that one. Um, so teachers, again, if you've got questions, pop them in the chat. Um, we've got uh, a couple related to portfolios. So you mentioned about Seesaw as one, one of the portfolios. Um, someone's asking, you know, how, how can they make portfolios for students? So maybe what other tools or what strategies you have around that? Yeah, look, I think, you know, uh, of course you can use all sorts of tools and some of them are paid and some of them are free. I think the main thing uh, is, is the pedagogical intent. What is it that you want your learners primarily? What is it that you want your learners to learn in the first instance from, you know, maybe recording their learning? Depending on the age and the experience level of your students, if, if this is fairly new to them, I wouldn't give them some sort of complex and activity where they have to record all sorts of details about what they learned and when and where and how, etc. It would just simply overwhelm them. But it could just simply be uh, initially, could, could be on paper, could be on a Google Doc, just recording my learning. And it could just simply be, you know, jot down what you did this week. And on a scale of one to five, or use an emoji, how good did you feel about that? How helpful was that particular activity for you? Okay, now at the end of the week, Friday afternoon, let's all open that document or get that piece of paper. And let's choose the top three that, that were the most, that you found to be the most helpful or satisfying or motivating, whatever. Okay, let's share. What have you got? What have you got? And then, well, let's write it on the board. 
And this way we can actually start to not only get some good ideas from other people, which is a great example of peer learning, but perhaps more importantly, we can start to see that we don't just have to do what we would normally do. We can actually occasionally stop and think and reflect on what actually seems to be working uh, the most for us and what perhaps wasn't so successful. So you see the pedagogical uh, initial intent is just to simply to raise that uh, awareness, right? To get learners to start thinking about, hey, hold on, there's a different way. I could do this differently, maybe, right? And that's so powerful. That's so wonderful when you see that happening to, to your learners, that moment, it's just, it's pure magic. Great, thanks, thanks again, Hayo. Um, we're running out of questions. So teachers, if you have questions, pop them in the chat and we'll, we can get to a couple more. Or otherwise, of course, just feel free to contact me later if you can't think of your questions at the moment. If you've been to so many sessions today and your brain is full, um, feel free to reach out at any other point. Um, all right, well, here's, here's one more. It might be quite a simple one. Um, is asking if you have any recommendations for an LMS. Mm, no, not really, because I think they're they're all much of a muchness. I, I personally use Canvas, Canva, Canvas, sorry, Canvas. Uh, but uh, no, whatever works for your learners, really. I guess the most important thing that I look for is is what what are learners expecting. So in a university environment where a lot of you know I'm in a university at the moment here in, in Brisbane, people, you know students would expecting a certain interface with certain um, you know, facilities, et cetera, features. So I'll probably stick with, with a, a sort of a, an academic uh, learning management system. But if it's about helping learners to manage their own learning, and if they're fairly new to that, I would say initially just a, a simple portfolio or a Google Doc will probably uh, work, work just as well. All right, thank you. Um, that looks like we're out of questions. So if we've got no more questions from the audience, we can go ahead and wrap up the session. So thank you very much, Hyo, for the amazing presentation as always. Um, and uh, thanks for preparing that handout with all those wonderful resources. I'm sure all the teachers are gonna get, um, have a good, good look at that and have lots to, lots to look at. Um, so uh, thank you teachers for all your engagement throughout that session. And thank you again, Hyo. I hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Have fun. Bye-bye.